Thank you very much for the introduction. So it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to present the DOOM chip. Uh, this is a project I started about two years ago. It went through several iterations. And what I'm presenting now is the uh, DOOM chip on ICE, which is the last iteration of the project. And the reason for the name will become clear in a few slides. Um, so I really started this project because I wanted to learn about uh, designing hardware, and I thought uh, DOOM would be a perfect playground for this. Uh, but you know, if I have to imagine a reason uh, for uh, starting the project, it would be something like that, a strange message. All right, check this out. I was playing and something weird started to happen with the lights. I don't know, some sort of bug. I haven't seen that before. What's that? What in the world? How to keep you for the time being? Well, that would be fun for sure. A portable control. Nice. Okay, well, sounds like a plan then. Oh, very nice. Charming. How do I design a GPU? What kind of PGA? A shape shifting circuit? Oh, that sounds fancy. Oh, wow. Okay, now I'm getting worried. Shape shifting circuit, sense path, mount and mount. Ice 4TVT5K. All right, I've checked that out. Okay, wow, that was creepy. All right, so I think this gives us a pretty clear mission statement. Uh, we have to design a portable console. It has to have specialized graphics hardware, in particular for uh, terrain rendering. We are targeting early 1990s retro classics, and we'll be using a Lattice Ice 40 UP5K FPGA. And I will detail that in a few slides. Um, and what we are looking at, really, is to do a Doom Comanche uh, crossover. So if you're not familiar with these games, let me uh, click re quickly refresh your memory. Doom was released in 1993. I don't think I have to spend a lot of time uh, describing what it is. It's a groundbreaking game by id Software that was featuring absolutely uh, amazing graphics for the time. Uh, it was programmed, uh, the renderer in particular was programmed by uh, John Carmack. And if you want to learn all the gritty details ab about the technical things behind Doom, I highly uh, recommend the uh, Game Engine Black Book by uh, Fabien Sanglard uh, that focuses uh, on this particular game. Uh, Comanche is a game uh, that is lesser known. It was released in 1992, and it was a quite groundbreaking in terms of graphics. I mean, you know, most games in 1992, when they were in 3D, they were not even featuring uh, textures. And uh, here comes a game that had this crazy uh, voxel terrain with full textures and running in real time where you pilot a, a helicopter uh, through the entire game level. Really great stuff. And so the end result is a console where you can write games, where you can start indoors, open a door, and walk outside to explore the terrain. Um, and here, for instance, we are uh, you know, exploring this open uh, terrain, and uh, we will uh, at some point discover a new building that we can enter. And so you, can, uh, you have a lot of flexibility to add variety to your uh, game levels and to explore novel design possibilities. So if you are interested in Doom, uh, it's, uh, you know, there's a ton of great resources out there, and in particular, Doom is known to be easy to port to different platforms, uh, and I'm referring to uh, the idea of taking the original Doom source code and modifying it as Doom source ports, right? Um, and there are many of those available. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, game uh, engine black book on Doom has a full chapter on these different ports and how they were uh, achieved, and also there's a list on Wikipedia with uh, many uh, of these ports there, but I don't even think it's complete. Um, one port that is quite interesting to us is this port on the GBA. Uh, what's interesting is that it's a portable console as well. It's 240 by 160 pixels, 256 kilobytes of RAM, and 16.7 uh, uh, megahertz CPU, and it's reaching uh, quite a good performance between 15 and 25 uh, frames uh, per second. Um, in our case, we'll have less memory, uh, we'll have 128 kilobytes of RAM, and we'll have a much less powerful CPU. In fact, our CPU is going to be around uh, 6.25 uh, megahertz, and yet we have more pixels because we have a, a 320 uh, by 240 uh, pixel screen, and so we'll have to uh, find ways uh, to deal with that. Um, then uh, some other uh, source ports that are uh, relevant to us are ports on microcontrollers. Uh, here I want to highlight two that are uh, fairly recent, uh, and the one uh, on the left is, is quite crazy because it's actually 
using a microcontroller that was found in uh, an RGB lamp. Uh, it turns out there are powerful microcontrollers into uh, such things, uh, which is uh, quite strange. Anyway, um, so these microcontrollers are more than fast enough. In fact, uh, both uh, of them are 80 plus uh, megahertz. In addition, they have a one uh, cycle multiplier, which uh, is a big advantage compared to the 486, which uh, Doom was targeting, where a multiplication takes several cycles. Um, memory usage was a primary concern in this project and will share a similar uh, challenge uh, because you, know, you need some memory for runtime and uh, most of these uh, microcontrollers, you only have you know, some tens of kilobytes. And so what these projects do is that they rely on an external uh, memory, typically a spy flash, uh, where uh, they store the static game data and will do uh, exactly the same for uh, you know, things such as the uh, game level images. So what we want to do is not a source port. Um, instead, we are going to create a specialized GPU and a total recreation of uh, the game engine around it. And in particular, we want to add a terrain, which means completely revising the rendering approach. Oh, and by the way, and this has nothing to do with the project, uh, but there's a very uh, cool uh, Doom recreation for the fantasy console Pico 8 by uh, Frederick Sochu. And so if you're interested in Doom and uh, you know, the way you can revise its rendering, this is uh, definitely another project to check out. All right, before we design any hardware, we need to understand what are our design constraints. So we are targeting the Lattice i40 UP5K FPGA. This is a low cost, uh, power efficient uh, FPGA, and it's available on several uh, open source hardware boards, such as the FOMU or the Icebreaker, and there are many other options. Oh, and by the way, I did an early version on the FOMU. Uh, this one is really, th this board is really impressive because you put it in your uh, USB port and it completely disappears with it, but you can still put a few uh, wires and enough to run uh, a spy screen as I'm showing here. Uh, but for this project, we'll actually target the icebreaker. Um, regardless of the choice of boards, what's great is that the um, ICE40 uh, UP5K is very well supported by the uh, FPGA toolchain, the open source FPGA toolchain, sorry, uh, which means that you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, installing gigabytes of bundle tools and going through crazy license processes. Uh, you just uh, install uh, Yosis, NextPNR and get started with it. All right, so our target is the icebreaker board by one bit square. Uh, if we look at the board itself, it has the 16 megabytes of spy flash uh, that we uh, want to use. And the reason most FPGA boards have a spy flash is because the FPGA configuration is actually stored into uh, the spy flash memory. And at startup, the FPGA uh, fetches its configuration from the spy flash and then uh, uh, starts to uh, uh, you know, run as the circuit you want it to be. Uh, the FPGA itself has 5,280 logic cells, and I will explain what a logic cell is on the next slide. Uh, it also has a very nice feature, which is 128 kilobytes of SPRAM. This is very fast uh, memory that your uh, design uh, can access directly from the uh, FPGA. Uh, and uh, by fast, I mean that you can uh, read and write to this memory in uh, one cycle. So really fast. So what's a, a logic cell in an FPGA? A logic cell is uh, made of two things, a lookup table that is configurable and a flip-flop that you can choose to use or not. The lookup table is uh, uh, simply a table where you have, uh, that defines the value of the output given all the possible values of the four inputs of the cell, A, B, C, and D. And so for all possible uh, zero, one value of A, B, C, and D, you have 16 entries into this table and you can choose what will be the output depending on these values. Uh, and this is how you configure uh, this uh, logical uh, cell to be any logical gate uh, that you want. The uh, second very important uh, component into the logical cell is the flip-flop. And so what the flip-flop does is that it uh, will uh, retain the value of the output until the next clock uh, cycle. Uh, what that means is that even though A, B, C, D might be changing during the current clock cycle, until the clock ticks, until there is a positive edge on the clock, the output is not refreshed. When the um, uh, positive edge comes in, then the output is refreshed with the value um, uh, from the uh, lookup table. All right, and all these logical cells are organized in a grid, and in our case, it's, it's a grid with uh, 5,000 of these uh, logical cells. And the other thing that you can uh, configure in the FPGA is the routing between the different cells. So you can choose which output con outputs connect to which input internally to uh, describe uh, and, and uh, obtain the circuit that you want uh, the FPGA to be. Uh, 
Uh, of course, you're not manipulating directly the uh, lookup tables and the uh, flip-flops. Uh, instead, what you do is you uh, describe your uh, hardware in a, in a language, which looks like a programming language, and typically that's very log or very HDL. And then you uh, send this through a, a software chain that will produce a bitstream for the FPGA. And so if you use open source tools, as we uh, will do in this project, you will go through Yosis, NextPNR, and then, for instance, open FPGA loader to load the bitstream into the FPGA. Uh, the DOM chip on ICE is written in CILIS. This is a language I developed, which is a thin abstraction above Verilog, just to make things a bit easier, and it has some conveniences uh, that are not found in uh, Verilog. Uh, just to have a quick example, here we're describing a design that is blinking uh, eight LEDs, and so the uh, main uh, circuit of the design has a single output, which is, well, in fact, eight outputs, because that's uh, an output with eight bits, one bit per LED. Uh, then uh, we have a counter internally, and then, you know, forever, for as long as there is power, what the design does is to, uh, apply, the, to sorry, apply the eight most significant bits of the counter onto the uh, LEDs and to increment the counter, right? And so this will be turned into um, a number of gates, uh, creating the adder for counter and then flip-flops that uh, will refresh the value uh, on uh, the clock ticks. Uh, and finally, some uh, routing to uh, go through the uh, output pins that are driving the LEDs. So is 5,000 um, logic cells a lot? Uh, well, you know, it's always hard to get a sense of that. Uh, you know, spoiler alert, it's not a lot. It's actually fairly small. And just to give you an idea, if we compare to Mister, which is an FPGA-based FPGA uh, hardware recreation project where, you know, many contributors are uh, recreating retro uh, computers and consoles, uh, this um, um, Mr. Board is actually using a Cyclone 5 FPGA that has 110,000 logical cells. So it's, it's you know, 20 times uh, what we are going to use. Obviously, a lot of the cores that are being developed uh, for Mr. are not using uh, uh, the entire uh, FPGA. They are using uh, some part of it. But it's just to give you a sense of scale. Um, it's also very much faster. What I mean by that is, you know, it takes time for your signals to traverse the FPGA traverse all the lookup tables and, and the configurable uh, routes uh, inside the FPGA. And some FPGAs uh, can, uh, um, you know, will, will allow signals to propagate faster than others. And the Cyclone 5 is about uh, three times uh, faster than the UP5K we're going to use. What that means is that if you have a CPU design that runs 25 megahertz on the UP5K, it can probably be uh, run at 100 megahertz on the Cyclone 5. So, you know, 5K is not a lot, but is it impossible to, uh, you know, create a GPU onto this thing and, and run uh, something like Doom? Well, you know, like all things challenging, there's always a talented hacker to uh, show you that, yes, it is indeed possible. And in that case, uh, this was done by Sylvain Munot, who goes by the alias uh, at TNT. And he showed uh, that you can actually create a small computer um, onto the uh, ICE40 that can run uh, Doom. Uh, and that means you can do a source port of Doom onto this uh, computer you create. And uh, it chose to architecture this around a RISC-V uh, CPU, which is using the VEX uh, RISC-V open source uh, design. However, to make this possible, he had to add an extra chip onto the board by soldering it on top on, of the SPI flash uh, chip. And that's to get extra writable memory, in this case, uh, eight megabytes of extra memory that is uh, required uh, for uh, Doom to run properly onto this board. So it's also quite interesting to see how uh, he used the uh, 128 kilobytes of SPRAM available in the uh, UP5K, and it's actually split between 64 kilobytes of cache for the CPU and 64 kilobytes for the frame buffer. And here it is uh, running, and keep in mind this is actually the full game. Uh, it's not only the render loop, so the game logic is also fully uh, executed. And so this reaches uh, a very reasonable uh, frame rates, uh, knowing the, the constraints of this uh, particular hardware. Um, so that sets quite a standard, uh, but of course there's no GPU, right? So the hope is that by building a specialized hardware, we can accelerate things maybe a bit further, uh, and also we can maybe provide something more general where we can have a drawing API so that we can create other types of games. Um, the other question is, can we manage to squeeze this voxel terrain in, which, would be, which is you know, a great feature to have, of course, uh, and can we do that without the extra uh, PSRAM uh, chip that has to be soldered on the board? Well, let's find out. Oh, and by the way, uh, I'm not going to reuse any designs. I'm going to build everything from scratch, uh, you know, for the fun of it, because I want to be uh, learning things. Of course, from an engineering standpoint, 
don't do that, go ahead and reuse all these great open source uh, hardware designs that are there. Before going any further, let's look at the memory layout uh, we uh, can achieve for uh, our portable console. Uh, the constraints are we have 128 kilobytes of very fast, you know, one cycle read write uh, memory and then 16 megabytes of spy flash that is okay to read from during rendering, but still uh, much slower. Um, what we would need is a place to store a 320 by 200 frame buffer, that's 64 kilobytes of memory, a place to store uh, level and textured data. Uh, this is, you know, several megabytes, uh, but the level itself is not so big, right? It's some tens of megabytes, of kilobytes, sorry. Um, and we also need some RAM for the runtime because we need to store uh, data structures as we render and to keep track of, of things during uh, rendering and during the execution of, of the game. Um, the conclusion is that basically the textures can go to spy flash. That's great because they're read-only. The level is not strictly read-only though. Uh, it would be better to have it in RAM. Uh, because uh, typically you might want to modify it, like opening doors and lifts and, uh, you know, maybe changing the lights and so on. Uh, but if we do that, this leaves us with less than 32 kilobytes for the runtime, because we'd have 120 kilobytes to start with. We remove 32, 35, sorry, kilobytes for the level, that's for a small level, and then 64 kilobytes for the frame buffer, and basically we're, we're left with uh, not much. So, uh, you know, the question is, could we get rid to, of the frame buffer because that would free up, uh, you know, 64 kilobytes, which is a significant chunk uh, of RAM. Well, it turns out that because we designed a portable console, there's hope, right? Because we're gonna uh, use uh, an external small screen, which is typically LCD or OLED. These use the SPI protocol and they typically have an internal frame buffer. So there's no need perhaps for us to keep the frame buffer on our side. Uh, the problem is that accessing pixel uh, randomly uh, is fairly slow because it means you have to first send the coordinates of the pixel and then the color of the pixel you want to access. So in order to avoid uh, the uh, random access, we have to stream pixels to the screen and that is something that is possible. Basically, you give the screen a first coordinate, uh, a width and height, which will be the full screen width and height, and then every time you give it a new pixel, it's actually automatically incrementing the coordinates on screen. So you can just stream the pixel's data, which will be uh, RGB uh, 565 uh, in our case, so it's two bytes per pixel. But of course this means that we have to find a way to render from top to bottom or from left to right. It doesn't mean that we cannot have uh, in memory a single uh, row or column so, so that we can randomly uh, write pixels into this one row or one column, but when it's done we have to send it to the spy screen so that we always go you know, in the same order. Um, and in fact, we'll use left to right ordering and we'll be rendering columns. There are several for that, for several reasons for that, as I will explain later. Okay, so before uh, we uh, go into the details of the hardware, we have to recall how it was like to be rendering a textured polygon in the 1990s. So when you want to draw uh, textured triangles, you first uh, put the triangle into the view space and then you divide the x, y coordinates of each vertex by the z coordinate. This is a perspective transform. Then you overlay the grid of pixels and uh, you can uh, quickly determine which pixels are inside. There are several algorithms to do that. And this typically gives you a barycentric coordinate in every uh, pixel, which are interpolation weights from uh, the vertices. So given that, it's very tempting to associate a texture coordinate to each vertex, that is a location in an image, so that you can use the barycentric coordinates to interpolate the per vertex texture coordinates and get one coordinate in every pixel. Once you have that, you can sample the image to get a color, and this is what happened here. Well, the problem is that even though you will get colors onto your triangles, uh, this is actually wrong. And what I mean by that is if you implement it this way and look at, let's say, a quad, which is rotating like that in the view, you will see this weird, uh, you know, texture distortion that is often uh, referred, referred to as texture swimming, right? And this looks pretty bad. So how do you fix it? Well, in fact, uh, if you want to compute correct texture coordinates in every uh, pixel, what you have to do is to first interpolate the UV coordinates divided by Z from the vertices. You obtain that for your particular pixel. Then you interpolate one over Z from the vertices. You obtain the value for your particular pixel. And then you divide both for this pixel, which means you have a per pixel division now. And that's going to be bad news because per pixel divisions are expensive. But first, let's make sure that this does indeed correct the problem. And here you can see that now we have a very nice uh, texturing effect. 
that makes a complete sense uh, given the, um, the uh, rotation. So it's accurately representing uh, the perspective uh, effect that is happening here. So why is a per-pixel division bad? Well, a standard uh, division in hardware is one cycle per bit that is fairly slow. You could do more bits per cycle, but it's going to cost you either logic and or a megahertz, which means lowering the frequency. And uh, that's not what we want, right? Uh, if you have less cycles but lower frequency, it's not really a gain. So there, you have to find the right balance between these two things. Um, so it's fine to do a slow divide in a few vertices, but not in every pixel. For this, that's really uh, absolutely a no-go. Um, we could choose to not be perspective correct, like the PlayStation 1 uh, did in its days, but it's, you know, this texture swimming is, is really a, a bad artifact to have. Uh, the only way around is to add more triangles, smaller triangles, more vertices, and, and then, you know, you're just going to do more divides anyway, so the gain is not very clear. So are we doomed? Is there no way around this? Well, of course there is, right? And um, the way around is to notice that there are special cases to this, in particular the vertical and horizontal surfaces, because on those you get a constant uh, Z for uh, pixels which are in the same column and in the same row of the screen. And that means that you can share the same one over Z division for all these pixels. So that sounds promising. Let's take a look. Uh, here is a, a wall seen in perspective. For this particular column, all the pixels are at the same depth, so they have the same one over Z value. So it's enough to locate the first pixel in the texture, and from this first pixel, we can texture all the other pixels in the column sim simply by moving by a, a same constant spacing uh, in the column of the texture. And this spacing is proportional to the value of one over Z. Then we can do that for all the columns of the wall and get a perspective uh, correct textured wall. So that's a good reason for streaming columns, of course, because we have many walls in our game levels. So now let's have a look at the uh, floors and ceilings, which are called flats in uh, Doom terminology. So for a given row, you have the same uh, constant uh, Z value. So one over Z is also constant. You locate the first uh, pixel in the texture, and then you advance along the row by a fixed amount, which is proportional to Z, and you get a perspective uh, correct floor. However, uh, there is uh, one uh, thing that is, uh, there is one big difference compared to the walls, which is that the player is exploring the scene. So the view is actually rotating with respect to the uh, vertical axis. And this is what you can see here. So the sampling pattern is not uh, as uh, simple as with the walls. So, uh, you know, since we have this complication anyway, I, I started to think that maybe we could find a way to uh, draw the flats column by column. Um, and indeed, if you uh, look at how to draw the flats column by column, at first it seems complicated because you have, you have this complex spacing between the samples in addition to the rotation. So for now, let's remove the rotation, let's move to an infinite plane, and uh, let's look at this from the side. So we have the, uh, and we are gonna look at this for one particular column and one particular pixel, which is the one in yellow. From the side, we have the eye, we have the column, the pixel, we're going to throw a ray from the eye through the pixel, and this ray will hit the ground at some UV coordinate, and these are the texture coordinates we want to compute. What we do know is the coordinate of the pixel on screen, let's call this Y screen. We also know the height of the plane with respect to the viewpoint. And what we want to compute is the V texture coordinate that corresponds actually to the Z, that is the depth of this point in the view. And thanks to the perspective transform equation, we know that Y screen can be computed as H over Z, because we want to obtain z, we are going to rewrite this equation as z equals h over y screen, and we know both of them, so that's good. Well, yes, but that's a per pixel division again, right? Uh, but the thing is, y screen is actually not so bad, um, because y screen, uh, being the coordinate of the pixels on screen, is limited by the screen resolution, which is to 40 in our case. So we can pre-compute 1 over y screen and store that in a lookup table that we can access efficiently when we draw uh, this, uh, this uh, column. Uh, now for x, we can proceed in the same way. Uh, we know that x screen equals uh, u over z. We know x, we know z, uh, because we computed it uh, from, uh, for the v coordinate, and so we can obtain the u coordinate as x screen times h divided by y screen. All right, that gives us the uv, and we can efficiently obtain a perspective correct flat through uh, this uh, lookup table. There's another advantage of drawing columns, which relates to depth and uh, visibility. Uh, 
Uh, in these DOOM levels are organized in a data structure called the BSP tree. That's a very important uh, 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 data structure to know if you're interested in computer graphics. I won't go through the details. Please refer to the black books by Michael Abrash and Fabien Sanglar uh, if you want to know the specifics. But the important thing about it is that it gives us a very efficient way to order the walls uh, given the viewpoint. So if we're standing at some place in the game level, we can get all the walls ordered, for instance, from front to back or from back to front uh, very efficiently. Um, so that's great because now that means that if we're located somewhere in the scene, looking here, for instance, uh, on the left, we get all the walls uh, nicely sorted from the viewpoint. However, it doesn't mean that we know when to stop drawing and in particular, if you know we are drawing the scene, but we have to draw from back to front all the walls in the entire scene, we're going to waste a lot of time uh, doing that. What we'd like to have is a way to completely ignore what's in the back, because clearly from this viewpoint, we are quickly the, the view is quickly obstructed uh, by this wall here. Um, <coughs> and this relates to a, a very uh, hard problem in computer graphics that is uh, called uh, the visibility problem. Uh, that is what you know what exactly is visible from a given viewpoint. It turns out that Doom allows uh, to do exactly that by rendering uh, front to back and give, giving us a way to stop early. And the reason this works is because as we render this scene, we are going uh, to first uh, encounter this wall here for the middle column, which means we'll draw a piece of ceiling, a piece of floor. Then we'll draw what is known as the lower um, wall and the upper wall. And then we meet this um, um, middle segment, middle wall, that is opaque, and from this point on, we know that we can stop, and we don't have to look at any of the, uh, of the other walls uh, behind, behind that point. And the reason this works is really because the um, levels in Doom are uh, 2D as seen from above. That means that you can't have a room above another room. Everything uh, seems to be two-dimensional if you look at it from 2D, but of course, the floors and the ceilings have a given height, which gives you this very nice you know, 3D uh, look uh, uh, and complex look to the level. So it's a very elegant and clever trade-off between design of freedom and you know performance and constraints for performance. Um, and because it is uh, 2D with only you know a given elevation for the floor, for the ceilings and for the floors, you have this property that as you draw these arrows from the top and from the bottom can only uh, go along one direction. So from the top you can only go down from the bottom you can only grow up and when they meet at the middle wall you know that you can stop because there cannot be anything else in terms of geometric complexity. Very uh, important uh, idea in, in the Doom engine. Great stuff. All right, we have now to say a word about the terrain and how we're going to draw it. Um, so for the terrain, we'll have two maps in memory. This is going to be stored in SpyFlash. We have the height field, which is defining the elevation on the left. It's going to be a eight -bit, uh, an 8-bit elevation field. And we have the color field on the right, which is uh, palettized using the uh, Doom palette. Uh, this is data straight out of Comanche, uh, which has simply been recolored to match the Doom palette uh, on the right. So we are going to look at this from the side. We want to draw a specific column of the screen, which is shown on the left. And the terrain is actually going to be uh, columns uh, with some specific height. And what we do is we throw a ray from the eye through the screen onto the top of the column. And this actually gives us a coordinate onto the column. If this coordinate is increasing, we draw the additional pixel. If, it, if it's decreasing, if it's below the current altitude, we simply skip it and don't draw anything. And so we draw only when uh, the coordinate increases. And if you do that for every column, you actually get uh, something that looks like a terrain when it has uh, more than you know, uh, 16 by 16 pixels. Uh, if you look at this from above, what happens is that we are traversing the height map and we are simultaneously traversing the uh, color map to be able to texture all the pixels that we draw every time we find a new altitude and we find where it ends up on the screen. And so this you know, interleaving of the lookups makes things uh, a bit interesting, but really what we're doing here in, in both of these maps is really uh, closely related to what we do for the floors and ceilings, uh, which means we can actually reuse a lot of the, of the logic uh, uh, for uh, the same purpose. So there's a lot of reuse uh, even though we're drawing a terrain instead of simply uh, drawing something that is flat. All right, so how do we, how do we render uh, with columns only? Um, let's have a look first at the overall algorithm. So we go through the scene BSP and this gives us a list of all the walls from front to back. Here, uh, all the walls which are being drawn have been sorted and you can see that they are 
um, more or less uh, uh, shaded depending on the distance uh, from the view. Then we project the candidate walls on screen to get a first and last column for uh, the walls uh, to be drawn. And then for each screen column, we traverse all the walls. We uh, draw if a segment is covered by the wall. Uh, we will uh, draw the lower, upper and middle walls uh, as I've just described before. And we, if we encounter a middle wall that is opaque, we know we can stop. We don't have to consider any other walls. And that's why in this animation, only the green walls actually contribute to the viewpoint. All the others are not even uh, touched by uh, this uh, third step because uh, they are being uh, occluded by uh, a middle wall that is drawn before they are uh, considered. Uh, here is the code from the firmware. We uh, iterate over all the columns uh, in, uh, on the screen. Uh, then we iterate over all the walls. We check if the column is covered by the projected uh, wall. And if yes, we draw lower wall, upper wall, and middle wall. And if it is a middle wall, we uh, verify if the uh, wall is opaque or not. And if it is opaque, we just stop here, right? The break is actually going to uh, exit from uh, the loop that goes uh, through all the walls. All right, so now it's time to design our graphics hardware. Um, when you do your uh, own hardware and your own software for it, you have a lot of freedom in where to place the cursor between you know, hardware and software. In fact, uh, in my first iteration of the Doom chip, I, I was uh, completely um, on the uh, left end of the spectrum doing pure hardware without any CPU, and the whole rendering uh, loop was uh, completely done with only lookup tables and flip-flops, basically. Um, that, that runs uh, very fine, but the problem is that it's requiring a lot of uh, logical cells, and uh, in this particular design, it was 17,000 logical cells, so that doesn't fit onto the UP5K, of course. Then on the other hand of the spectrum, you are uh, using your FPGA to design a very nice computer architecture onto which uh, you can run a source port of Doom, and this is what uh, Sylvain Mino did uh, in his port. Now what I want to do with the Doom chip on ice is to be somewhere in the middle uh, so that we have you know, the best of both worlds uh, possibly. Uh, so what we'll keep on the CPU is the view and perspective uh, transforms. What we'll put in hardware is everything related to column drawing because of course all these per pixel operations is what is using a lot of cycles for a CPU. And so if we can accelerate this, uh, that's a lot, that's big burden out of the way uh, for the CPU. So here is the overall design. We have the CPU that sends draw calls to the GPU. Then the GPU uh, is reading uh, uh, texture data from SpyFlash, and when uh, it has produced a column, it's sending it to the Spy screen uh, so that we're streaming continuously uh, pixels to the Spy screen. Uh, here is how the communication between the CPU and the GPU occurs. It goes through a command 5.0. Notice the uh, end of column call here that will come. And this will actually swap the two column buffers between the one we draw and the one we send to the spy screen. So why we send to the spy screen, we can start drawing another column, which is great, because sending to the spy screen is actually uh, fairly slow. Uh, here is how the draw queue uh, looks like from the CPU side. This is what you have to write in firmware. So first, we have a, a little helper function that will write uh, two 32 bits uh, value at two specific memory addresses, which are memory map addresses. So this will uh, be interpreted on the hardware side, not as being RAM accesses, but as being draw calls. Here's how we send a draw call for texturing uh, the ground. Here's how we send a draw call for an upper wall. You can see it's decorated slightly differently. And here you can see how we send a draw call for a terrain column, which looks almost the same, but it's just uh, tagged as being a terrain. Uh, what's common about all these calls are the texture IDs and where to start and where to stop drawing in the column. So these are uh, pixel coordinates along the Y uh, direction. And then uh, we can send the end of a uh, column uh, call, which will uh, swap the two columns and send one column to the spy screen immediately. Now from the hardware side, uh, we uh, first, uh, the logic is first checking whether the CPU was uh, issuing um, some, something in a memory map address and whether it was writing to it. Then we uh, decode the address to uh, see exactly which memory map address was used. And if it's a draw call, we uh, copy the first parameter, we copy the second parameter, and uh, we perform a few checks on the uh, data which is being sent to verify it's valid. And if it is valid, we uh, you know, update the second parameter uh, to the, uh, in the column drawer inputs, and then we pulse the in-ready input of the column drawer so that it, imme it immediately stores that into the FIFO uh, queue. All right, so now that we understand the communication between CPU and GPU, let's have a closer look uh, at this GPU. So inside the GPU, 
we have a FIFO, the FIFO queue uh, that stores the orders from the CPU. Uh, we have a texture sampler that will uh, you know, read texture data from SpyFlash given a UV coordinate. Um, and then we have this uh, big component here, which is a column drawer that does uh, all the heavy uh, uh, things, such as drawing the flats, uh, drawing the uh, walls, and drawing the terrain. To do that, it internally has two, well, three other uh, subcomponents. Uh, one are the two column buffers, that's essentially memory. Uh, and then one is a segment drawer that does the actual draws using the texture sampler to access um, texture data. And finally, it has a column sender that will uh, send the uh, columns that have been finished uh, just before to the spy screen. So these two here are uh, active in parallel so that while we send to the spy screen, we can draw a new column. So here is uh, how it looks in hardware. This is a column drawer definition. You can see uh, the, uh, two, uh, the three things that we uh, just uh, modified from the uh, memory mapped uh, access. There is a pulse that tells that a new uh, draw call is coming, and there are the two 32 bits uh, words of the draw call. Then it also has access to the screen. That's how it will uh, send data, uh, send the, the, pix the pixels uh, to uh, the screen. And finally, uh, it also emits uh, two signals, which are whether the uh, FIFO is currently empty or whether the FIFO is currently full, because of course, the CPU has to stop if uh, the uh, draw calls, uh, the draw, uh, if there are too many draw calls pending into the FIFO, the CPU has to stop, otherwise it will overflow and bad, bad things will happen. Uh, and last but not least, the uh, column drawer also has access to the spy flash so that it can actually read uh, texture data from uh, the uh, spy uh, flash memory. Internally, it has um, uh, two sets of uh, fast uh, memory. These are called VRAMs. It's different from the SPRAM I was mentioning before. This is actually a uh, RAM that is distributed throughout the uh, FPGA, and so there's really not a lot of it, but it's uh, extremely uh, efficient um, to use uh, in the designs. And that's typically where you put a FIFO uh, such as this one. It stores the uh, 64 bits, which are the two 32-bit words that we receive per draw code. And then we have the two column buffers. Uh, you can see that we have the doom chip height power of two plus one because we have two of these uh, column buffers and they're contiguous, uh, but we have a bit that tells us which one is being written to and which one is being sent to uh, the uh, spy screen currently. All right, then uh, still inside the column drawer, we instantiate two other uh, chips, which are sub chips embedded into the bigger uh, column drawer chips. The first one is a segment drawer that we discussed before and the second one is uh, the uh, column sender that will send the columns in parallel to the uh, drawer. Uh, the drawer yeah, has access, of course, to the column buffers. It has access to the spy flash to read uh, from textures. And the column sender has access to the uh, column buffers as well, of course. And then it has access to the screen because it's streaming pixels to the screen. And here is the uh, main uh, logic of the column drawer. It is always active. Uh, the first part uh, that you will uh, see here is uh, dealing with uh, getting a new draw call. So if uh, inReady is pulsed, it will actually write this new draw call into the FIFO and increment the uh, location where we write into this FIFO. And then the uh, second part, uh, which is active when uh, you know, we're not receiving a new draw call, will actually try to execute the next uh, pending draw call. So if the FIFO is not empty and if we are not already drawing, then it will uh, get the um, uh, next order from the FIFO and it will decode it to either uh, spawn the um, to either spawn um, um, a draw call or to uh, trigger the uh, column sender. So here we uh, decide that we need to start the column drawer because a new segment needs to be drawn. And here we uh, decide that the um, uh, we receive sorry the end of column uh, tag, and so we uh, start sending the uh, column that is ready to uh, the uh, spy screen. By the way, whether the column is ready or not is the responsibility of the firmware, right? The GPU has no way to know that the column is complete because this is dealing with visibility of the scene. And so, of course, the firmware will uh, send these end of columns, uh, you know, or fully uh, when uh, they are required only. And finally, here you can see how we uh, increase, increment, sorry, the address of the FIFO uh, based on whether or not we were able to do something. All right, um, so uh, let's go back to the global architecture and now we'll spend some time uh, talking about the segment drawer, which is a, really the main piece uh, of the design performing all the flats and, and, and uh, walls and terrain uh, drawing. So it, it draws uh, all of that and 
because there is a lot of common uh, points uh, between how we draw uh, walls, flats, and terrains, all of this is actually interleaved into the same logic. Um, internally, it has a pipeline running in parallel two things. One is a texture sampler. So when we have a new UV coordinate, we run the texture sampler to fetch the color. And in parallel to that, we actually compute the next UV coordinates for the next pixel so that we can squeeze everything uh, into uh, uh, nine cycles at most uh, for this. So the segment drawer has the following inputs and outputs. Uh, in terms of inputs, it has a pulse to tell it to start, and of course, it has the parameters of the draw code that it's about to execute. Uh, then it has the column buffers uh, with a bit that tells into which of the two buffers it should be drawing. Uh, and of course, it has access to the spy flash to <coughs> be able to read uh, texture data. Um, internally, it instantiates the uh, texture sampler that it will be using uh, to uh, fetch uh, data from SpyFlash. Um, it has a, a per column depth buffer that I haven't detailed, uh, but uh, in fact, since we draw per column, we can you know, afford a depth buffer, and that's uh, actually very useful when you deal with transparency, when you have to draw your sprites after drawing the environment and stuff like that. It has the pre-computed table of one over Y screen, in fact, uh, you can see that this table has more entries than just the screen resolution, and this is for the terrain, because we're also use, using it uh, during uh, uh, terrain uh, recasting. Um, and uh, of course, we can do that because we clump the maximum distance uh, throughout the terrain. Um, and yes, here you can see how it's being computed by the preprocessor, uh, which is actually a, a code in the Lua uh, language, and that's the preprocessor of uh, CDs we're using here. Uh, and here you can see some of the things it has to do, like it's decoding the texture ID from uh, the input uh, draw call parameters. And here it's decoding the, uh, where to start drawing the column and where to start, where to end, sorry, uh, drawing uh, the column as well. Uh, also clumping in case the uh, input value is above the max. Uh, so here you can see some of the internal computations being performed. Uh, the first thing you have at the top is a multiply and add uh, construct. And the reason it's um, uh, separated from the rest is because we want this circuitry here to be synthesized only once and then reused uh, many times by the computations we do, we do. So A, B, and C are actually registers. And whenever we put values in these registers, at the next cycle, result uh, will be refreshed. And this constructs allows to uh, uh, instantiate that only once because that's a fairly expensive circuitry. And also by doing that, your sys is able to uh, use the DSP hard blocks, which are available into the FPGA. Uh, then we have uh, the um, then we have the uh, uh, main uh, chunk of logic, uh, and here I'm just showing some of the computations that have to be performed. Uh, the idea is to perform different computations at different cycles. That's why you have a state here um, um, uh, register, and the state register is increasing unless we have already reached uh, the last state. Uh, and we also change what is uh, performed, uh, which steps, which steps, sorry, are performed depending on whether we are drawing the terrain or not. Uh, and here you can see two, uh, the two first uh, things that are computed in the two first cycles of drawing a flat. And uh, I hope you can recognize here the one over y screen times h, which uh, gives us the uh, v coordinates, and the uh, h over y screen times x that gives us the u coordinates. And this comes directly from uh, the uh, computations we described earlier in the talk. All right, here you can see some more uh, internal logic still of the segment drawer. And here this is uh, how it is starting, uh, addressing a new draw call, deciding uh, where it should end, uh, refreshing the current, uh, the value of the current pixel uh, being drawn, and then uh, setting an internal register to um, uh, remember that it's actually uh, in the process of drawing something. It binds the texture uh, by uh, calling the texture sampler because the texture sampler needs to uh, get some specific uh, parameters of the texture, like the width and the height and the uh, you know, first uh, address of uh, the texture in memory. Uh, and so if the texture ID is not the same as the one we were already sampling, then we have to tell the sampler to uh, perform its binding process. And then we initialize the current uh, U and V uh, coordinates, and this is a bit different between terrain and uh, walls and flats. And then when we are actually drawing, uh, we are actually waiting for this sampler delay thing that uh, is actually um, 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 a bit that goes through a sequence where you know the bit is at one every nine cycles. So this rotates around and every nine cycles this bit will be to one and this uh, lets us know that a texture sample is actually available. If a texture sample is available, 
we uh, decide whether we're still drawing or not. And what still drawing does is basically to compare current to end. And if current has not reached end, then we are still drawing. If we're still drawing, we have to keep uh, fetching uh, pixels. So we tell the sample uh, to keep fetching. Uh, and we uh, reset the computation on state. Recall that state was used in the switch case that I showed just before to uh, do the different computations across uh, different cycles, well, across the nine cycles uh, of the entire uh, sequence. Uh, and finally, if we are not uh, ready, if, if a sample, sorry, is not ready, uh, we uh, keep uh, waiting. So if we are uh, drawing, we simply uh, shift this bit that I was describing that goes through, you know, uh, nine uh, different locations before uh, coming back. Uh, and this is the one uh, telling us that uh, a texture sample is ready. All right. Um, I was mentioning SpyFlash. Let's have a look at the uh, SpyFlash uh, controller. So my controller is uh, quite specific because it is optimized to allow for uh, random uh, accesses. And it can, uh, you know, through the use of, uh, of the uh, Quad uh, Spy uh, protocol and some other features of the uh, SpyFlash uh, chip, it will uh, require only, so to speak, 11 cycles to fetch a byte from a, a given address. And here you can see a sequence of the renderer. Uh, here you can see the steps, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That these are the nine uh, computational steps that we have to do before getting uh, the next UV coordinates and uh, receiving the next uh, texture sample. This I can probably reduce because I'm currently running at 50 megahertz and I could go up to 100 megahertz, but I have to deal with some uh, uh, timing considerations to uh, successfully do that. But there's potential for a uh, faster performance. All right, let's say a few words about the CPU now. I'm using the ICE-5 Dual, which is a design of my own, also written in the CVS language. It's a RISC-V RV32i design with uh, two cores, which are actually interleaved to reuse a lot of the logic so that the final uh, design is quite compact. But then I modified it to have uh, one cycle shifts, one cycle multipliers, and a hardware division that runs in uh, 34 cycles. So of course the end thing is, is uh, bigger, it's probably around uh, 2K um, uh, logical uh, cells, uh, but it's always a bit hard to separate from the rest of the design. It runs at 25 megahertz, but it's only uh, dealing with one instruction every four cycles, which means it's actually more like a 6.25 megahertz CPU. So that's not very fast, but it has two cores and the two cores are interleaved. So in fact, uh, one core will issue one instruction every two cycles overall. Uh, in all the demos I'm showing, uh, I'm actually only using a single core, which means we have one core uh, waiting to be used, and it's probably going to be uh, for the game logic uh, in the end. All right, we've seen a lot of stuff. Let's have a quick recap. Uh, the hardware specs, the final hardware specs of the console uh, are a dual core 6.25 megahertz uh, CPU, a 320 by 240 spy screen, 16 megabytes of external spy flash memory, 128 kilobytes of fast RAM, uh, that is uh, uh, fully available for uh, the firmware. And we have a GPU that deals with uh, uh, efficient column drawing of walls, flats, and terrains. So how much code is that? Well, in terms of hardware, it's uh, 1,700 lines of uh, CDs. It can probably be cut in half if I remove all the simulation and debug stuff out of it. Uh, in terms of firmware, it's uh, 1,400 lines of C. Um, and uh, similarly, it can probably be made a, a bit shorter than that, but not so much, right? The, the firmware code is quite compact already. So in terms of uh, synthesis and resources, it's actually using 85% of the uh, UP5K. I'm tempted, I'm tempted to say 85% uh, only, uh, but maybe it could be made a bit, a bit smaller, right? Um, I'm thinking of the segment drawer in particular, it's a bit bigger than it should probably. In terms of megahertz, we are uh, validating the design at 2324 uh, megahertz uh, for the uh, um, uh, CPU part and uh, 50 to 60 for the uh, spy flash uh, access part. And we're actually overclocking it at 30, uh, 60 megahertz. So I wanted also to show you how easy it is to create a level for the Doom chip on ICE. Here I'm running the Slade editor, which is a modern level editor for Doom. And I've simply created a patio in the middle of a big room, which is filled with a terrain texture. And the player is initially standing on the patio. So once you have done that, you uh, can simply uh, call the make and compile scripts that are uh, going to extract the data from the uh, uh, files that have been saved by Slade. And it will produce a header file that is compiled together with the firmware. And this will hold uh, both the uh, level data as well, of course, as the firmware source code. Uh, 
So we'll go through this process and it will flash the board. And at the end, I can remove uh, the uh, reset jumper to uh, start uh, explore the level. So let's wait a little bit for this process to complete. All right, it's done. So let's remove the reset jumper and let's check we're on the patio. No problem here. And let's start exploring the terrain. We can turn around a little bit and maybe, oh, I just hit the wall of the room. And here we are with the patio in front of us. All right, and here is another example. Here I modified uh, E1, M2 to add a big chunk of uh, terrain outside. And here we are uh, starting outside and we can you know, walk around uh, this terrain and try to find the entrance uh, back uh, into the level. I think I have to go in this direction, probably. Then move around like this. And is this the entrance? Yes, it is the entrance. And now I'm back inside the level. And of course I can go walk around and get back to uh, the inside of the level through this door here. And we are uh, back inside. So if you're familiar with the levels, hopefully you can uh, recognize uh, the layout here. Yes, with this and here. All right, so uh, it's very early in the morning, uh, but uh, I thought I uh, wanted to really add this segment uh, about some uh, really cool debugging that just happened. So I was a bit disappointed by the performance on the terrain of this uh, E1M2 segment that I've just showed you. Um, and, you know, as the video was uh, encoding, I took another look at it and it turns out there was uh, indeed a problem. And the problem is not so much a bug in the uh, firmware, it's actually a problem with the way I was putting the texture on uh, these walls. As you can see here by the three ic icons that appear um, at the bottom right, which I'm thinking right now is hidden uh, by the uh, image, so I'm going to show it here. Um, you have, uh, I had three times the terrain texture on the upper, middle and lower, lower walls. And because of the way the firmware is written, this meant that it was actually issuing one draw call for each of these walls, effectively uh, issuing three a uh, call uh, to the uh, column drawer for the terrain. So basically I'm drawing three times the terrain, which is the most expensive thing to draw uh, in the uh, entire uh, renderer. Uh, so that was pretty bad. And this is why this thing was, was clearly uh, running uh, not uh, as it should. So I fixed that simply by, you know, removing uh, two of those. Oops, that was only one. So by removing two of those, keeping only the center one, and then this is actually fixed. How did I uh, find out? Oh yeah, let me show you that it's fixed, right? So if I go outside now, and you know, the terrain is much, much faster than what it was before, right? And so we can go there, you know, turn around, move over there, and we went from a sluggish, oh, I'm actually hitting the walls uh, of the border here, right? You see, so this is much better than it was before. It's perfectly smooth and I can, you know, go back inside, no trouble at all, go back up and we're gonna, for the fun of it, we're gonna exit through one of these windows because the collisions uh, are not currently preventing this, right? And so I can just move around a little bit more. Ah, it's great to see this running much better than it was before. And so the way I found out about this bug is by looking at the firmware code I, uh, I instrumented in simulation uh, the uh, terrain uh, draw calls and, you know, whenever we're uh, changing column. And I noticed that there were way too many uh, terrain draw calls uh, and that's how I found out about the issue in uh, the actual uh, level of the game. Cool stuff. So now some fun facts. There's quite an interesting problem, which is that uh, the uh, terrain height is not accessible from the CPU. And the reason is that only the uh, GPU has access to the SPI flash memory uh, during rendering. And so we can't really uh, fetch this data from the CPU. And so the way to solve that is actually to ask the hardware, uh, what is the current value of the terrain altitude? And we do that by sending a specific draw call, uh, which is a terrain draw call, of course. And we uh, um, have a special bit that tells the hardware that we want to know uh, the value of the terrain uh, at this particular location. And we do that uh, only for the center a column of the screen when the start distance of the terrain is zero, which means the player is actually standing on uh, the terrain. And on the hardware side, we uh, are simply uh, tracking whether we should do picking. And if it's not done already, 
we take the value we just sampled from the uh, height map and uh, store it uh, in a register that is then uh, read back from the CPU. So some other gotchas. Uh, this one was, was quite tricky. I really thought I bricked my, my uh, FPGA board uh, because when you put spy flash in a weird mode, then the programmer can no longer properly access it. Um, and the problem is that the FPGA is immediately configured every time you power up the board. So once you have done that, uh, at every power up, the spy flash is put in this weird mode and you can no longer program it. Fortunately, uh, the designer of the, of, of the board, uh, one bit squared, thought of that and there is a nice um, a jumper that you can put on the board to uh, hold the FPGA in reset so that you can escape uh, this kind of gotchas. Another one that I uh, stumbled on uh, during, uh, over the course of the project is a bug in the uh, DSP synthesis. Uh, and, uh, you know, this was really weird because everything was working fine when I was synthesizing without DSP, but then with the DSP I would get a different result. And the problem was actually stemming from the way assigned uh, signals are dealt with during synthesis, and I had to took a deep dive into Yosis to fix that. Uh, that was really fun to do, and hopefully it will also be useful to uh, some other people. I put a patch out there, of course, uh, to try to uh, fix that. So fixed point uh, arithmetic is really tricky. I, I didn't discuss that, but I only have integers. And so every time there is a fraction, it's represented uh, using a fixed point. And, uh, you know, if you don't properly deal with your fixed point precision, you can run into a very weird rendering artifact, such as these ones, which were uh, later fixed. I have a few more of these issues that I'm currently tracking down, but this is always a bit tricky uh, to find. Uh, so how do you survive all these gotchas and all these difficulties? Well, the thing is you have to use simulation. Uh, when I started uh, hardware design, I wasn't spending enough time doing simulation because you need to build a nice framework and you know you have to deal with peripherals, external memories and so on. But it's absolutely essential you do and there are great open source tools like Icarus Verilog and Verilator that will help you do that. In particular Verilator is great because it generates a C++ code from your design and then you can you know add some other C++ code like to emulate the screen, the memory and so on. So it's extremely convenient. And thanks to this, you're able to debug and to find out most of the issues unless they are timing related, in which case it will work in simulation and not in hardware, which is how you know it's probably timing related. Uh, so what's to improve in the Doom chip on ice? Spy flash should be running at 100 megahertz, and I really have to do that to get a better performance, in particular on the terrain. Um, I have to put sprites to make the game complete. In fact, I have an early prototype of that. I thought it might uh, be ready uh, before this talk, but it's not. Uh, so it's currently, um, you know, a, a, a bit rough around the edges and too rough uh, to show. Uh, like I said, fixed point uh, is not everywhere robust, so it needs some fixing. And of course, I'd like to write an API and documentation so that you can write your own game for this portable console. So definitely stay tuned. Please uh, follow me on Twitter if you're interested. And I'm pushing updates uh, quite frequently. Thank you very much for following the talk. I hope uh, you enjoyed it. There was, there was a, a ton of information. That's, that's a lot. Um, I really hope you will get excited about designing your own uh, hardware. This is absolutely fascinating. I mean, the idea that, you know, what you're seeing now is uh, completely done uh, from, uh, you know, my own CPU, my own uh, GPU, my own firmware. I mean, everything is custom is, is really great, right? It's a, it's a great feeling. It's a great experience. I highly encourage you to, to try to do that. Uh, and by the way, it's showing a cool effect uh, where, you know, this door appears uh, out of nowhere because terrain is just another texture. And so you can paint terrain on the walls, uh, so to speak, uh, using this uh, uh, renderer. Thank you very much.